Hello, my friends, and welcome to the Seeds and Weeds podcast, brought to you by Small House Farm. If you're looking to celebrate plants and the people that love them, then this is the podcast for you. Thanks for joining us. I'm your host, Bevan Cohen. Hello again, my friends, and welcome back to the podcast. Today, we're going to be getting fruity with Susan Poisner. She's the founder of OrchardPeople.com and author of the new book, Grow Fruit Trees Fast. She's going to be sharing some tips on how we can get our fruit trees well-established and healthy so we can be enjoying that tasty, sweet fruit in record time. Before the interview, though, some updates. Here at Small House Farm, autumn is in full swing. And there's just something to be said about this time of year. It is so beautiful. You know, the colors, the smell in the air, the sweaters, hot cup of tea. It's cozy and relaxing. But, you know, there's still tons of chores to do to get ready for winter. We're cutting and splitting wood, bringing in the last of the herbs to dry, and seed saving. There's so many seeds coming in right now. Of course, we got our winter squashes coming in. And our summer squashes, too, the zucchinis. I mean, they're just getting mature right now. So we're bringing those in for seed, lettuce, flowers, beans, beans. Beans, beans, beans. Even though they had a bit of a struggle early in the season, the bean seed harvest this year has turned out to be phenomenal. We're going to have lots of seeds to offer for next year's gardens. You know, you can actually get a sneak peek of a few of the varieties that we're going to have over on our YouTube channel. You know, we recently posted a video. It's a bit of a tour through the drying rack, you know, checking out just the seeds and herbs that we were processing that day. I'll put a link down in the show notes in case you want to check it out. And did you know that you can also listen to the podcast over on YouTube, you know, if you're into that sort of thing? According to the info that we get from our hosting site, though, most of our listeners are tuning in on Apple Podcasts, which yeah, I guess that makes sense. You know, it's the largest podcast platform out there. So if you are listening right now over on Apple and you like what you hear, maybe you can give us a rating or a review. It's always nice to hear what people think. Otherwise, it's just me in this little room talking into a microphone. And the same for you folks over there on the YouTube. Leave us a comment. Tell us what you think, what you like, maybe what we can do better, whatever. Tell me about your gardens, anything. I would just love to hear from you. Some folks that I have heard from recently are are our Patreon members. You know, we were just shipping out their seasonal gift baskets and some folks have been sending us some really nice feedback. Rachel Helms said, I love, love, love my gift basket. Everything smells so good and I can't wait to have a warm mug of tea when the weather cools down. Well, Rachel, it is certainly cool down here in Michigan and I'm ready for some tea myself. Wendy R. commented, thank you so much for such an amazing variety of products in our boxes. Made my day. Wendy, you made my day. You know, we put a lot of time and love into these seasonal baskets, so it's just so cool to hear from folks that are really enjoying them. That's that's awesome. Thank you so much, everybody, for the feedback. Of course, anybody can support the podcast by joining our Patreon community. And it's our patrons that make the show possible. If you want to learn more about our Patreon and the member benefits, you can always find the link down in the show notes or over at seedsandweedspodcast.com or even directly at patreon.com slash smallhousefarm. And thank you to our newest subscribers. We got Brian, Jeanette. KEC, Molly K, and Deb Ferrari. You folks are awesome. Thank you so much. Now, let's get on to that interview. Susan Poisner is an urban orchardist in Toronto, Canada, and the author of the award-winning Fruit Tree Care book, Growing Urban Orchards. She's an instructor of fruit production at Niagara College in Ontario and the creator of the award-winning online fruit tree care training program, orchardpeople.com. Today, Susan's joined us on the podcast to share some fruit tree knowledge and talk about her latest book, Grow Fruit Trees Fast. Hello, Susan. Welcome to the show. I'm happy to be here, Bevan. I am so excited to have you with us here today. Uh, now, we're going to be talking about fruit trees and your uh, new book, Grow Fruit Trees Fast, which I'm really looking forward to getting into. But first, let's learn a little bit more about you. You're the founder of OrchardPeople.com. Can you share a little bit with our listeners about that and uh, your background as a fruit tree grower? Absolutely. So I started OrchardPeople.com because this was the exact situation or uh, organization that I needed when I planned my first fruit trees back in 2009. So I started a community orchard in my local park. This was a very visible project and I was very naive. I planted fruit trees with another group of uh, volunteers and we thought it was all going to be quite easy. At the same time, there were a lot of people who did not want us to plant fruit trees and they felt the fruit trees would be messy and would cause problems in the park and ruin the park, which by the way, wasn't a really nice park anyways. But still, I did not want to be responsible for any problems. And at first I didn't think there would be any problems. However, fruit trees do what they do and they are a little bit high maintenance. So within a couple of years, they started to get sick. 
various uh, problems like rust popped up. And I thought, uh oh, I better do something about this because I really need to learn how to care for these trees so that they are healthy and productive. I really needed this project to be a success. So that launched me on an adventure to learn myself how to grow fruit trees successfully. And then once I learned, people started coming to me to say, hey, can you teach me how you're doing this? How are you growing fruit trees in the community? How are you growing fruit trees organically and successfully at all? And I started to teach other people. And that's how Orchard people started. Oh, that's awesome. Now, your bio also mentions that you're a journalist and a filmmaker. Uh, I'd like to hear more about that aspect of your work, if you'd like to share. Well, I started being a totally different person, Bevan. I was not a person who really played in the soil very much. When I grew up, I was more interested in sort of more intellectual pursuits. And I really love to write and I love to create. So I became a journalist. I uh, lived in the United Kingdom for 10 years. I worked for the BBC World service. I traveled around the world. I lived in Russia. I lived in Israel. So I had a really interesting career. But when I came back to Canada in my 30s, uh, things had changed in the media world. And I needed to find something new to do. There was just a lot of competition and it just wasn't resonating with me. I married my husband, Cliff, and he's from Trinidad and he loved gardening. So he introduced me to gardening, which just lit up my life. And then in that process, I started to learn more and more about trees. And I realized that trees are so special to me. You know, you don't get as connected to sort of a zucchini plant in your garden. You plant it, you enjoy the zucchinis or the tomatoes or whatever, and then you dig it up and it goes in the compost. But trees can last a long, long time. And I see them more as beings than as sort of neutral plants. And so I fell in love with trees and all they do to make our environment better. And of course, I fell in love with fruit trees because they, like other trees, they clean the air, they stabilize the soil, they shade our communities, but they also feed us and they are so magical. I love what you said about trees are like beings because you're right. You know, I do love my zucchini plants and my tomato plants. And I feel that we have like a short relationship. You know, it's a real fiery burnout like throughout the season. Um, it gets hot and heavy for sure. But then it's over, like you said, and then we have to move on to something new. But a tree is with us. It could be there almost our entire lives. Absolutely. It can be there for your kids and for your grandkids, depending on what type of tree you grow, what rootstock it's on. Trees make such a huge difference, Bevan, in the world. They really do. They're they're going to help us out of this climate crisis we are in. They are so loving and kind to us. Your recent book, Grow Fruit Trees Fast, I thought it was a perfect guide for beginners, you know, folks that are just looking to get started growing fruit trees. But I thought it also had some great info for people that may already have experience growing trees and maybe they're looking to improve their production. The first lesson in the book is about choosing the right trees. Now, is this as simple as just picking apples or pears or whatever it is that you want to grow? How do you go about picking the right tree for your orchard? Well, absolutely. And that was the first big lesson I learned by making mistakes. Um, you know, we just grabbed the, the trees for our community orchard from, you know, garden centers, whatever they had, we ended up taking. And it wasn't because I didn't want those fancy other cultivars. I had taken books out of the library. I learned about all sorts of cultivars that sounded absolutely mouthwateringly delicious. However, these books were published in California or far away from where I lived and the, the trees were not available available in the nursery. So we went to our local nurseries. What was available was, you know, Bartlett pears and Macintosh apples and Honeycrisp apples, which are now so popular. All of those very popular cultivars. The problem is those cultivars are popular because they are in the supermarket and we know what they taste like. And they're also popular because they are grown on big industrial orchard properties um, where they use all sorts of chemical inputs to grow these trees successfully. But if you're growing in your own backyard or in your local park, it has to be easy. And so there is such a thing as disease resistant fruit trees. So these fruit trees were naturally bred to be resistant to some of the common diseases that will make a mess out of your orchard, like apple scab and like uh, rust, pear trellis rust, and all these different diseases, even fire blight. If you research and buy, for instance, an apple tree that is resistant to those diseases, your life is going to be so much better. You aren't going to have to face them. There are other issues and problems like pests that you will have to deal with, but that takes a whole host of problems off your plate. 
Now, you've mentioned this community orchard that you helped create. Do you have fruit trees at your home as well that you grow? Yeah, that's a great question, actually. We live in a house and we do have a backyard and I have done some good experimenting there. So in my backyard, I have planted a espalier, uh, espalier apple trees and a cherry tree. And it's called um, UFO, which is sort of like a cherry uh, fruiting wall. Now, what I discovered after about five years is that my garden also has a soil disease that either you have in your soil or you do not. And the soil disease causes problems with fruit trees and the apple trees. It's called crown root gall. So the apple trees did not thrive in the long run and we had to take them out, plant something else there. No more fruit trees can go there. The cherry tree is still doing good. So I'm hoping that the soil disease does not go to the other side of the garden. But most of my fruit tree growing work takes place in the park. Well, that's okay because that way the whole community gets to enjoy it. Oh, I'm really glad you said that. The thing about growing growing fruit trees in the park is it can't really be about the fruit. What happens is we have wonderful cherry harvests and lots of people come to the park and they enjoy the cherries with us and it's fantastic. It's early in the season. But with apple trees, those apples are hanging on the trees throughout the growing season. Lots of people notice them. People go to the trees. They maybe even pick the apples. They taste them. And in fact, we have had many situations that happens over and over again where people will come with a big bag and harvest everything on the tree. So it can be heartbreaking, uh, especially when they do it. They do this with our plum trees before the plums are actually even ripe. There are certain communities that take unripe green plums and put them and make them into some sort of pickles or chutneys or something like that. It means that sometimes the volunteers don't get to taste the fruits of their labors and it can be very sad. However, what you do get when you grow in a community setting is A, you get to grow different kinds of trees, more types of trees. Trees, you get to work with your friends, but also you get to build community and work together. So our orchard is about the harvest, of course, but it's about the education. It's about learning about trees and teaching others how to care for them. And the best part of it is it's about building the community. Another one of the chapters in the book you talked about, and I love this so much, feeding the soil, not the plants. I thought, oh, when I read it, I was like, this is just such awesome advice. So could you break that down for our listeners, what you mean by that and why that concept is so important? Oh, yes. I'm glad you brought that one up. In fact, that was my, that's one of my favorite chapters in the book. And it was the hardest one to write because like many people, I have been so confused about fertilization, whether it's, you know, vegetables in my garden, uh, whether it's per perennials and especially fruit trees, because like I said to you, I see fruit trees as beings, you know, they need food to survive, to live long and healthy lives. So I think the misconception out there is that we go to the garden center and we buy these like bottles of this, that and the other, these chemical inputs, and we sort of maybe water them down and put them around the roots of our tree and that the tree takes it in. I've started to look at feeding trees in a different way. If I know that my soil is rich in nutrients, then actually the live organisms in the soil will feed my trees for me. In contrast, if I go and buy synthetic fertilizers from the garden center, which are expensive and often damaging to the environment, it'll look like it perks up the tree, but it bypasses the soil organisms. Those soil organisms will die or disappear. And then I have to keep getting more and more of this stuff from the garden center to feed my trees. I totally dig this. So how do we know which nutrients we need to feed to our soil to make our trees happy? So great question because your soil, Bevan, is going to be different than my soil, depending on where you live. And my neighbor's soil even might be different from my soil. So there's two ways uh, that I would think about it. When anybody plants a new tree, I do like, it's not essential, but I do like for them to do a soil test. They aren't very expensive. What I really want to know is, is there any major components, major nutrients missing from your soil? Is the pH right? You know, is your soil generally okay? After that, really what I would suggest people do is in the early spring, every single year, spread out compost or well-rotted manure around the roots of your fruit tree. The part of the fruit tree, the roots are the ones that take in the nutrients, which are, as I said, are created by those soil organisms 
organisms or, or released by the soil organisms. But the feeder roots are at the uh, outer part of the canopy. They're sort of under the drip line of the tree. So in our park, we remove the grass up to the outer drip line of the tree. It may be a very big mulch circle. And then we mulch with compost or well-rotted manure, one inch of well-rotted manure or two inches of compost up to that edge of the canopy. That's interesting. You know, some of us might think when we're side dressing our plants or uh, mulching with compost, as you put it, that we would stay near the trunk or near like the stem of the plant if we're thinking about our gardens or something. But you're talking about going all the way out to the drip line of the canopy. So quite, quite a, you know, a distance sometimes from the trunk of the tree, we want to be able to spread those nutrients out all the way out there. Yeah, absolutely. And one of the biggest mistakes people make, I'm also a, a, an ISA certified arborist. And one thing that arborists hate is something called volcano mulching. And this isn't just with fruit trees, it's with all trees. A lot of landscapers do this. So they create this sort of volcano or triangle of mulch and they push it up against the trunk of the tree. So it's maybe like a foot around the tree's trunk and it goes up on the tree. So the mulch, whatever it is, whether it's compost or whether it's wood chips or whatever, is could be bringing moisture towards the trunk of the tree. It can cause wood rot. But what I've seen more than that is somehow it seems to be a welcome mat for boring insects, fruit tree borers. They find their way into the mulch. And then once they're in the mulch, they find a nice little tree trunk and they dig a hole into the tree trunk and they start to dig inside the wood of the tree. So volcano mulching is not a good thing. We Instead, we want to create a mulch circle, which sort of looks like a donut or a bagel. And um, you want to make sure that the soil is totally mulch free for about six inches around the trunk of your tree. Got it. So donuts good, volcanoes bad. Yes. Easy enough. All right, let's keep rolling through the life cycle of this plant. In lesson six, it's all about pruning. When to do the pruning, how to do it well. Could you give our listeners just maybe a few tips on pruning their fruit trees? The first tip is one that is counterintuitive because you think when you plant your tree, you want it to grow bigger, right? You you want it to grow. So why would you prune your tree? at that time. But actually, the most important time to prune your tree is right after you plant it. And this is specifically if you plant a bare root fruit tree. So not a potted fruit tree from the garden center. That's a little bit different. Bare root fruit trees come from specialist fruit tree nurseries. So on my website, orchardpeople.com, if you put in the search bar, if you just search for the article on nurseries, you can get a whole list of fruit tree nurseries across North America. Anyways, this bare root tree will be a very young tree. You will plant it and then right away you will prune it. What it does is it reduces the number of buds that this little tree has. And when they're that young, you can actually cut them in half. I would usually do less, but let's say you cut off half of those buds. Each bud will get twice as much energy. Those branches will grow longer and can grow stronger and it can support better quality and sweeter fruit. All right, Susan, what are your links so folks can find you online? listen to the podcast, all that groovy stuff. Well, I would love it if they went to orchardpeople.com. I have lots of articles. I have podcasts. I have online courses where I will teach you guys everything you need to know about how to grow fruit trees successfully so that they are healthy and productive. Super cool. I'm putting all those links down in the show notes. Susan, thank you again for being on the show with us today. That was lots of fun. Oh, thank you, Bevan. You take care. There you go, my friends. We have come to the end of yet another show. A big fruity thanks to Susan Poisoner for being our guest and to all of you for tuning in. Remember, if you enjoy the podcast, you can always show your support by joining our Patreon. That link and many more can be found at seedsandweedspodcast.com. This show was edited and produced by everyone here at Small House Farm, and the music you're enjoying right now is a little funky teaser by MFCC. I'm your host, Bevan Cohen, and we'll see you next time.